Okay. Um, so my favorite quote about teaching is actually about picking pockets. Uh, Paulo Robin is Robin, excuse me, uh, is a world famous pickpocket. He was asked, you know, how how do you do this? How do you do this well? And people asked about fast hands and practice, and he said all those things are important, but most important, pick, picking pockets is about the choreography of other people's attention. And I think that that is a great way to describe teaching. <laughs> it's less lucrative. <laughs> now I have a question. How many uh, people here uh, know what improv is, have seen an improv show? How many people are fans of comedy in general? Has anyone performed improv? <laughs> oh, I was hoping that would be zero. <laughs> but I will press on regardless. Uh, I think that you can uh, think of stand-up comedy as very much like the traditional lecture format. And I do traditional lectures as well, right? You want to have a nice, tight 50-minute set uh, that builds upon itself has surprises and goes somewhere, right? But one of the things that I have been interested in recently um, are the aspects of the class where I see a certain amount of control, right? Um, and those usually involve some kind of question to the class. Okay, so uh, how, how can this go wrong? We've all had situations where uh, the, the questions go in a direction that we're not expecting. Very often, um, uh, we're guiding and facilitating what's going on. Um, but I have also been very interested in the past couple of years in how we model professional practice in the lecture. We have talked about the lecture teaching certain skills, right? We're teaching facts, we're teaching uh, maybe meta skills but also modeling professional practice. I've also been interested in getting teams working well together, so training teams to work well together, uh, because a lot of projects in engineering require this kind of teamwork. And I thought, this was kind of an epiphany for me, which is kind of sad, maybe I should model that behavior in class. <laughs> and I thought long and hard about it. I'm gonna give an example. Very often, um, I, I would say especially maybe in STEM, but feel free to argue with me on that. Um, I have a particular answer to a question. I would ask a question, and there is a particular answer that I'm looking for. It is the one that is most supported by the data, for example, is factually correct so far as we know, or it could be simply what I am prepared to talk about that day. And I will give an example of how I think this can go badly, and I've done this many times. Imagine I am asking a question like that. Um, I'm thinking of a number one through six. Can anyone tell me what that number is? Three. Three. No. Four. No. Five. Five. Uh, five. Excellent. Excellent. What is being modeled here? A couple things. Number one, you should feel really good. All the rest of y'all may be a little sad, maybe a little worried about the, the exam, right? But what kind of professional practice is actually being modeled here? Okay, how do we arrive at the right answer? If I'm lucky, you think you arrive at the right answer by having a bunch of people saying it until an authority figure says it is correct, right? Worse, if I'm not lucky, you think, well, you have the right answer. You're just a person that had the right answer. And that's how you arrive at the right answer. And if I don't have the right answer, I have no idea how I'm going to get there. So improv is based on the idea of yes and. And this is the model through which I'm trying to have in-class questions work. And I'm still struggling with it, and I expect to struggle with it after I retire. But I have found it in many cases that it is a useful way to sort of organize these questions. And the idea of yes anding is in an improv show, if someone says, oh look, an island, that the other person in the show doesn't go, that's actually a dragon, <laughs> is that you accept the reality that one person is introduced into the room and then you run with it. And in science and in engineering, realities don't have to be correct to be interesting. Right? If somebody says, well, I think that the answer is plutonium, right? Instead of saying, no, 
anyone else, right? <laughs> we'll abandon plutonium completely and move to, some, to another hand. Is to say instead, oh, interesting. Okay, so let's think about the consequences of that as an answer. Let's, let's take that as a hypothesis and start working it through. And the goal is even when we move on from that, that that does not seem in the structure of the in-class discussion as a wrong answer that was quickly moved on from, but instead was a step down the road to a better answer. That, oh, okay, so uh, let's talk about the consequences of this. Can anyone talk about, it? oh, so that is counter to this data. Or, um, well, you've, at, you've brought up a really interesting point. I have to give you more data to consider this structure that we haven't brought up yet. So let's say you did the experiment and then this happens. Well, that's counter to that. So what do we think now? And now the person that said plutonium doesn't feel like they were just wrong. They felt like they were participating in a process that can eventually lead to an answer, which is a much better model of professional practice, I think, for all of us than what very often happens in classrooms. No, 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 no. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>